Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. And I am really excited to have with me today Kenny Down. Kenny is the author of Darko, The Sacred Heart of One Johanny Darko. Kenny lives in Seattle, Washington, also in the Pacific Northwest, as do I. His other works include Awakened Giant Sleeping Spirit and The Care and Keeping of a Shan, as well as an array of poetry, short stories, blogs, and vlogs. Kenny, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Becky. I'm happy to be here and doing this interview with you. Great. Well, I would love to start off and just hearing a little bit more about you and about the writing itself. How long have you been writing and is writing your full-time endeavor at this point? Writing is my full-time endeavor at this point, although I still do some work with ocean policy and fisheries, sustainable fisheries practices. And so I'm still an advocate in that arena as well and something that's very close to my heart and something I've done for most of my life. But my writing has always been something I've enjoyed through the years, but I got, I I don't want to say I got caught up, but I was in corporate America for uh, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And I had the first book that you mentioned, Awaken Giant Sleeping Spirit, which literally sat on the shelf as a nearly finished manuscript for 12 years as I finished up my career. And now that I've got the time, I've been doing uh, a lot of writing and I've got another book in the works. And so I'm really thoroughly enjoying it and trying to put all of my efforts towards being an author. Oh, that's great. That is really great. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, having those almost finished manuscripts on the shelf. I've experienced that myself. So uh, congratulations on that. Tell us a little bit more about this book, why you wrote this particular book, Darko? I I was attracted to writing the, I, I had the idea of this book in my mind for a long time. I had read several books about the history of Joan of Arc and the things that she accomplished as a very young person. And as you probably know, Becky, but for the listeners that may not know, she was a visited by the, the the voices she called them and right. and uh, and she was visited by the voice which was Saint Margaret uh, uh, and uh, the Archangel Michael to name a couple that would visit her and told her that she was going to end the Hundred Years War and that she would have victory over the English and set France uh, as an independent nation free of British rule which she did all of those things and and she accomplished that well, she still to this day was the she was the youngest supreme commander mm. of a large modern military force ever in the history of of the world and she served in that role and was eventually captured and put to trial and the only charges that would really stick was wearing men's clothing and that was what she was convicted of. And that was a capital offense because she did it more than once. And so she was burned at the stake. And so I thought about, and when Joan of Arc died, uh, she was 19 years old. And so you think about all of the battles she went through. She was wounded in battle and the things that she went through. And she was uneducated and she had no, she, she was illiterate. She didn't know how to read or write. She had all these things, but she was just so spirit-filled that she was able to accomplish all those things, regardless of all the obstacles that were in her path. And and so I thought, well, what if for today's society, somebody was born that was a Joan of Arc, a messianic figure that would come and help bring about the coming together time where people from all races and religions would come together, where people with all ethnicities would come together, people from various backgrounds and economic abilities and education would come together and we would have this coming together time. What would that look like? And I think I thought 
you know, the story of Joan of Arc, I traveled to Rouen, uh, France, myself, and along with my wife and did a lot of research there. That's where the trial existed. And the, and so I, the more I learned about Joan of Arc, the more I researched her, the more I knew that this was going to be the, this, this was going to be the protagonist in the next book that I would write. And so that's when I wrote this book is what if a, it's really asked, answers the question of what if a Joan of Arc was born in the United States in today's world and what would that look like? And so this is a story of a young woman that that's really the the motivating factor. It's a story of a young woman who began to be visited by the voices, and uh, is was became a messianic figure of our times and brought together the coming of the coming together time and solved the problems of the problems that we see today in social and environmental justice issues that plague us and are so divisive in in our communities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love what you were saying about the, you know, in in spite of all the obstacles and what she was able to accomplish, uh, part of what that triggered for me in my mind was how so often it is, it, it's like the the fire that, and maybe it's the, like alchemical fire, right, it, that those who become the greatest inspirers are often the ones who have overcome the greatest challenges. Anyway, that was, I love what you were saying. And, and, and that's so yeah. cool. And when you were doing that research, what kind of, were, you know, were you looking at artwork, doing, look, reading documents? What kind of materials were you able to, to find as a part of your research? Well, the answer that I would give you is my research was in all of those areas in okay. in viewing the artwork and going to the church of Joan of Arc which is in Rouen France and to visit the site and to sit where literally to sit in the in the spot where they brought her to the town center and and burned her alive and dished out this torturous you know terrible capital punishment to her. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I, and I went to the museums. I went to places where I could sit with some of the books. One of the things that's really amazing is that the, the French, even in those days, um, hundreds of years ago, were very modern in their court systems and their trials. And, the, and so a lot of these documents exist. Hmm. And, and you can read the transcripts of the questions that were asked of her and how she answered them and uh, what a remarkable person she was. And so it's incredibly inspiring in that respect. And so uh, obviously being a, a not being a, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but I'm not a French speaker. So I had to visit the museums where there was a lot of translation to English on some of these documents. And and But mainly it was sitting with a pen and paper in meditation and being inspired. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was really, really inspired when I was sitting in those places. And I was writing this book as I was, was there. And I did the, there's a portion of this book that that happens in Washington, D.C. At the, at the Great Mall there in D.C. with the Lincoln Memorial. And I, I went to D.C. and I sat on the steps and, you, you know, where I envisioned her giving this great speech that she gave that's a part of the book yeah. on how these things were going to transpire and uh, begin to have, you know, so many followers that I sat on the steps and wrote that part of the book was written is with me sitting on those steps. So... It's a little bit of everything, but I would say I would really give the the most weight to the to the meditations and the prayer and the actual writing that I did when I was yeah. inspired by being in those locations. I, I love that. It feels like so in alignment with this person who was very in tune with the spiritual message, you know, whatever. I don't know what words to use to try to keep the door as wide open as as possible for what that can mean for different people. But to be an open channel maybe is a, a good way to put it, uh, that you were there in meditation being an open channel for to understand this other open channel. I think that's very cool. Yeah, I think that's that's very true that in this book and in the Joan of Arc's own life that was the inspiration for this book, and thus the title, you know, Darko, that, that's if you were in France, it would be Johanny Darko, it would not be John of, Joan of Arc. And so the thing that was incredibly inspiring about her and that I put in this book and is that, you know, these voices started coming to, to Johanny Darko when she was seven years old. 
and she came from a place where she was impoverished. The the neighborhood, I thought, well, where would the kind of the French connection, where would this person be born? That was one of the first questions I had as I was doing the character outlines for this book. And yeah. and it came to me, well, this person being the French and the connection would would be born in New Orleans. And I thought, well, where in New Orleans would they be? And I've I've visited and spent time in New Orleans and spent quite a bit of time in Louisiana as a whole. And yeah. And I thought, well, they would come to, they would be born in desire. And, mm. and you know, that was the neighborhood. And so uh, it's a neighborhood that is, has, has an awful lot of beauty and a lot of really amazingly wonderful people. But it's also a neighborhood like many around our country that were, that are plagued by violence and, and drug addiction. And she was, you know, in that arena yeah. and yet still overcame all of that as a young child, just filled with this loving spirit to be able to go away. And she would go to these churches and synagogues and mosques, anywhere that community centers, anywhere that she would go to to feel inspired and to listen to what these voices were telling her. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. And that totally makes sense. The, how you would, it. thank you for like, putting all those connections together for us. That's that's cool. Now, I know that you re- will refer to this book as, as a wake-up call. And I get a sense of where that's, you know, how that is based on what you've told us already. But would you like to speak more to that? That How is this book a wake-up call? Well, I'd love to speak more to that because it's one of my favorite subjects. And be- I really have come to believe in my own life and from my own experience and my own spiritual awakening that many of us are, and I include myself in in this category, you know, many of us are what I call walking around asleep, dreaming that we're awake. Mm -hmm. And so the wake up call is, is like the rebirth, you know, the, the new idea, the new thought. And so this book is a wake up call that I, I've come to believe and and you know put a lot of my own thoughts into the into the book through the eyes of what how a person of Johanny Darko's upbringing would put it that you know for instance the you know a wake up calls the help is not coming from the top it's one of the analogies mm-hmm. that's in the book that is a, a favorite point of Johanny Darko's that you can change the king but until the kingdom changes. There's no change. And we've seen that in our country now, you know, Absolutely. that yeah. and, and I'm I don't want to get too political here, but you know, we had we have a lot of divisiveness and we had president who would be like the, the king and and a lot of people didn't like him and they voted him out of office and they voted in a new king and a lot of people don't like him and but it didn't do much for the divisiveness and I don't know that it did much to address these uh social justice issues of our day that are so common and that people are marching and fighting for and the environmental justice issues that seem to be set aside for for the purposes of corporations making money and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. The help for that's not coming from the top. That's a wake-up call. Okay, it has to come from, I believe, that the only thing that's, and that's what this book is about, is it has to come from a widespread movement of people who be, are willing to become spiritually awakened and operate from that plane rather than from this plane of the intellect and the knowledge and aspirations to have more money than your neighbor and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And you, now you hinted at this, but t- I would love to ask a little bit more about your own life and how you know, what things have happened in your own life that that specifically connect you to this book, to this story? Well, I, I really have had the, you know, this amazing experience of having accomplished a lot of things that people would have thought would be impossible for a person like me. So like Johanny, I grew up in a, in a home that had, that was really destroyed by alcoholism and drug addiction and, and, my mother and my and my stepfather at that time, who was the you know patriotic figure in in my life, and and uh, I was in group homes and foster homes and and eventually in lockdown institutions because I was got addicted to drugs myself and was 
committing crimes. So I didn't get a chance to go to high school. I was in, incarcerated during my high school years as a juvenile. And, you know, but I somehow, um, I've been clean and sober for 33 years. So on June the 8th of 1989, which is a big date, you know, for, mm-hmm. for myself and people in some of the communities that I, that I involve myself in, you know, that's an important date. And it's the date that I got clean and sober and began to really open my eyes to kind of had my spiritual awakening and realized that I'd been wrong about a lot of things in my life, that I was wrong about my mother, I was wrong about my father, I was wrong about my brother and my sister and my grandpa and my seventh grade gym teacher who failed me in PE and all of these these things that I'd been carrying kind of collapsed under the weight that you know, that I had taken part in this and, and that I wasn't a victim. And when I took that attitude, I began, and and also I took this great interest in the spiritual life. And I've really come to believe that for some people, either you find the spiritual life or, or you're going to be suffering. One of the two, there's no in between for some people. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I found that for me, that was the truth that that the happiness was found in the pursuit of the spiritual life and becoming a mystic and becoming open-minded to all uh, that uh, religion and spirituality had to offer. And so from that point, I found things that I didn't suspect. I was really good at business. So I was, you know, from everything is uh, measured differently in different people's minds. But, you know, I was very successful in the corporate world and I really thought, what would it go, what would it be like, you know, when I was first getting sober, I was homeless, I was a heroin addict. And mm-hmm. I thought, well, what would it be like to go from being a homeless person like that to becoming a millionaire? Yeah. And, um, you know, what would that be like? And and I actually had that experience. And, and unfortunately, it wasn't satisfactory. You know, it mm-hmm. wasn't the thing that because I... I, I really, you know, the, the, is I really wasn't exactly following my heart's desire. I was following some kind of a ideal, but I had a lot of those common things with Johanny in that respect. You know, growing yeah. up young like that, growing up, and then being able to accomplish some things that people thought most of the people that were in my position in business were, you know, Harvard MBAs or Berkeley Law graduates, and mm-hmm. and I would have to you know, sit at the boardroom table with these folks and hold my own. And and I would pray for intelligence and pray for inspiration, the right words and thoughts and actions and would come to me. And and so I I had no problem in that arena. And I think that's a lot like what it was like for Johanny Darko yeah, and her experience. Uh, so that's a little bit about, or maybe a lot about me. Oh, that's great. Yeah. But it's stuff that I, I like to share with other people because I think it can be inspirational. Yeah, it definitely. I'm really struck by, as you were talking about that, you know, once we let go of the need to be right, there is an opening in that moment of release, letting go of that need to be right, which it just feels like is, um, uh, it's like the, the moment that the seed cracks open and allows the growth to begin, you know. I, th- I I love what you said. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, Thank that's you right. The the there's a saying that says that uh, I love to find out when I'm wrong because it's one more thing I get to let go of. Yeah. And and <laughs> Johanny <laughs> Darko in her book in this book puts it a little differently. She says in in the book that the wronger we are, the writer we become. Mm. And that means that the more things you can admit that, yeah, I might be wrong about that. I'm willing to look at this from a little different angle. The yeah. more uh, righteous you are, the more, you know, right sized, right understanding, those kinds of things. Yeah. And even what you were saying earlier about the, the you know, we are in a at a, a time in history where it feels like we are incredibly divided. We There's so much divisive language and politics and uh, so much is just, and yet it is that, it seems to me, that very thing of like that need to be right. I need to be right with my stance, whatever arena it's in. Or you know, on the opposing side, that same need to be right. 
Whereas, you know, books like yours, like Darko, you know, where we can start to see, oh, wait a minute, if we could just shift this little, this one little thing, we, we have an opening. That's exciting. Yeah. It is exciting. Yeah. yeah. I think that, uh, you know, a big part of this book was the, was the desire to get this idea of the, of the coming together time in place. And, and I give attributes in, in the acknowledgements to this book to, to a couple of Native American elders that, that helped me to be sensitive to their stories and to, mm-hmm. and with their permission to share some of these things. But, you know, they've long believed in this coming together time. It's, 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 it's not, yeah. nothing new yeah. to them, but, uh, but for a lot of us, it's, it's new, but you and I, we, we live in, in Johanni, you know, is right in the middle of it. We live in the most diverse culture. Is is you can look at the the division that we have, and we certainly have that this huge division that feels just so ugly and awful. Yeah. But we also were living in the most diverse society ever in the history of the world. There's never been a time like this where there are so many people of different ethnicities and different backgrounds and the LGBTQ plus uh, movement and Black Lives Matter movement and these things that are top of our news stories. And, you know, in in my youth, some of those things had to be so closeted that, uh, you know, people would be banned from the tribe if they were to be found out. And now, you know, our children are going to schools where those kind of things were just everyday matter of fact things that that uh, people have two mothers or two fathers or or they come from a family where the mother the mother and the father aren't living together or people are you know look different it's just a, it's yeah. really an amazing and i think we are headed towards that and one of the things that's addressed in this book is well what's the timeline for that and johani lays that out exactly how that's going to happen and how that's going to how the coming together time will happen and i'm a I'm a believer in what she says. Beautiful. That is so beautiful. Is there any are there any other messages or takeaways that you're you're really hoping that your readers will I mean you've already covered several, but I just anything else that we've missed in terms of sort of those nuggets that you would like your readers on, on the larger scale to take away from the book. I'm sure there I mean, I know there are lots of nuggets throughout, but sort of big picture messages. Yeah, I think one of the one of the big picture messages, I think that, uh, you know, our young people and this is, you know, one of the quotes in the book, but, you know, our young and it's, this is, um, it, you know, our young people today are capable of these extraordinary measures. And and I don't think that we as a society, people, of course, nowadays are much old, get much older than they were able to and are in much better health uh, as older people. But we just don't give enough credence to what's possible in the lives of these young people that are all around us, that there seems to be this underlying message, you know, you got to wait for that. You got to wait. You can't, you know, it's going to be, you know, we've we've looked at like who the next uh, messianic figure, the next person that's really going to have this dramatic shift and change in the world is going to be. Maybe a lot of people wouldn't think it's going to be, you know, a young girl with no education, but it's, you know, I think that it's more likely to be that than than mm-hmm. anything else. And I think that's a yeah. great takeaway message from this book is to, is to, you know, look at the young people with a different set of eyes that maybe they are more intelligent and, and more intelligent and more motivating and more yeah. capable than we give them credit for. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Let's take a short pause and we'll be right back to talk about the audiobook process of production with author Kenny Down, author of Darko. There is nothing like a great book to transport you to new worlds. Here at Pro Audio Voices, we love working on projects that transport the listener. We pay attention to the details, like making sure we have actors that can clearly differentiate the character voices, making for a great listening experience. 
If you have a book that you would like to get into audio and you're looking for a team with a personalized approach, Pro Audio Voices might be just the right fit. Come visit us at ProAudioVoices.com. Let's talk a little bit about the audiobook specifically and that yeah. process. So first of all, I know that at first uh, when we were talking and knowing that the the book takes place in Desire, New Orleans, and at first that it seemed like that accent was really important, it became a little less of a priority. And uh, as we moved through that casting process, would you like to talk to us about that? Yeah, when we were first talking about doing the audio book and interviewing narrators, my original thought on that was that we needed somebody that really had the sound of somebody who was from not just New Orleans, but maybe that would be the particular dialect that you would have if you grew up on the streets of desire. Yeah, It, it became less and less important to me that we had that and more important to me that we had somebody that that I felt was really feeling what the book was about and they got it. And so when we settled on the narrator, who I know the the listeners are going to absolutely love, I just knew, boy, this is the right person. And the, the fact of the matter is that the dialects in, in, in New Orleans are quite diverse, even yeah. in Desire, right. that there's there's folks that you would hear from that would say you would think why well, did you don't sound like you're from New Orleans because it's a it's a big city and dialects are are very diverse there yeah so that yeah. that became less important when I realized the reality of what I was thinking about wasn't ne- wouldn't necessarily reflect uh, the the voice of the because the book is done by narration yeah. the book is is through the eyes of somebody who was there from the time that Johanny was a very young newborn and was by her side through her entire life. Yeah, that's great. And and I think that's, uh, I wanted to sort of call that piece out because I know that it's an area of, you know, that well, that many authors have to figure out in the casting process, like what is, what is the most important piece? And I think that you've, you've stated that very clearly here. It's like, is the narrator, or the actor, really connecting with that story and expressing that story the way that story wants to be told? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. The way the story wants to be told, and that's it's one of the things that that I, as I listened to the narration and was going through listening and proofing the narration of the story, it really occurred to me this this book is a very deep book because almost every page is filled with some spiritual lesson or another. Mm -hmm. And so you read it. It's not a a book that you said it is a real page turner because I've written this book and my other books in the same manner, which is that I want to have an entertaining story rather than just here are the facts and here are the 10 steps to enlightenment. And, you know, the, Mm-hmm. Here's the the great noble truths and on and on, yeah. and uh, I wanted to have those in the in a story. So it's a page turner. You're really like I got to find out what happens next because this is, you know, there's people working against her and there's people yeah. trying to shut her down. People that would like to see her her not exist on the planet anymore. Just like we would, mm-hmm. like like we've seen with these great leaders like Martin Luther King and Mahatma right. Gandhi and and a list of others that have faced those same kind of challenges. So you've got this beautiful story and it's a page turner. But at the same time, the there's these deep spiritual lessons. You get a, each page packs a big spiritual punch as well. So yeah. it kind of stops you in your tracks a little bit because you got to think, well, how does that apply to me? And wow, that's something I've never thought about. There's a lot of those kind of, the, wow, I've never looked at this in that way. Yeah. And... But with the audio book, what I found was that I think the I, I'm a little reluctant to say this is the author, the one who wrote this, but I think the audio book in some ways is better. It certainly will be better for some people yeah. because it's mm-hmm. paced in such a way where the story is just carrying along. And I think it's a more subtle way. Somehow these spiritual truths just kind of, you kind of absorb them a little easier than maybe you would if you were reading it. So I, right, I picture yeah. people driving in their car, flying on an airplane or something. What a great experience this is going to be for them. Yeah. 
And, you know, I, I certainly I as a listener uh, have listened to some of my favorite books multiple times, you know. Uh, so this is also an experience that we, I think, would expect for listeners of this, of this, uh, of Darko, because, you know, for that very reason, because you, you, you start to take it in. And as you, as you are absorbing that, it's, it's like being a sponge, right? You, you take in a little bit and then it's like, you got to go back for more. So, yes. Yeah. Exciting. What would you say, you know, about the process of producing the audiobooks? Is there something about the process itself that, that stands out to you in terms of your experience and that you might like to share? It, it was more complicated than I, I thought maybe it would. But I suppose as far as the thing that really stood out to me was the consideration of whether the author should read the book mm -hmm. or whether you should have a narrator. That was something that really stood out to me. And it was it was very early on clear to me that I would like to read the book. And I actually had advice from, as most, most uh, authors, um, you know, I have a group of people around me that reads stuff before it goes out to the general public and gives me yeah. feedback and that kind of stuff. So I inquired with them and many of them that had read the book said, oh, I'd love to hear your voice. I'd love to hear you reading the book. But that, that's not what I do, you know, mm -hmm. and and it clearly is what what Jim, the narrator, did do. You know, he, yeah. he this is what he does for a living. And so I was so happy that I had that realization up front that it should be somebody else to narrate the book that could do a much better job than I have. So that was one of the big things that stood out in the, in the process. And uh, probably the surprising thing was the, the, the way that the audiobook was able to bring the story to life. That was a surprise for me. I, I wasn't quite sure how this would come out because it is a, like I said, it is a deep book. It's a intellectual book. It, it's a spiritual book and it's also a, a fictional novel that's meant to entertain all of these at the same time. And so I wasn't sure how that would come out, but that was a, a really cool experience that I, that I had was the, how this is going to open this book up to a, broader range of people. That's great. Thank you. I'm sure that our listeners would love to know how to learn more about you and your books. So would you let them know what your website is? Yeah, my, my website is New Thought Life. Those three words, newthoughtlife.org. And so if you go to New Thought Life, uh, you'll see that. You can also just look up author Kenny Down. If you just Google that, you'll come up with a lot of stuff and you'll be led to my website and to, to my, my Twitter, Facebook feeds and uh, some of my audio work that I've, I've done and vlogs and, and blogs and some YouTube stuff that I've done. There's a pretty wide body of stuff that people can find, but just looking up author Kenny Down. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, again, this is, is Kenny Down, author of Darko, The Sacred Heart of One, Johanny Darko. And uh, Kenny, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much, Becky. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.